Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. government announced yesterday that the government was ready for serious discussions with the United Nations and the international community to promote security, sovereignty, peace and independence in the region based on just resolutions. However, Israel, Israel stuck to its stance that despite Hamas's willing, willingness to cooperate, it remained committed to destroying the Jewish state. The latest developments with Yumna Tayyara. The Hamas-led Palestinian government is ready to live side by side with all its neighbors. This statement was featured in a letter sent to the UN Secretary General from Foreign Minister Mahmoud Zahar, who referred as well to a two-state solution for the Middle East conflict, an outcome that would require the recognition of the State of Israel. The letter addressed to UN Chief Kofi Annan said that the Palestinians were looking for freedom and independence side by side with their neighbors and expressed their readiness to have serious discussions with the Quartet. The Quartet of the European Union, Russia, the United Nations and the United States are the sponsors of the stalled Middle East peace process and the drafters of the roadmap for the creation of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. The letter added that Palestinians were looking forward to living in peace and security as all countries in the world and for their people to enjoy freedom and independence. Yet the copy of the letter seen by AFP referred to this two-state solution to the Middle East conflict and said the Hamas-led government was committed to opening peace talks with the international community. An official in Zahar's office in Gaza City, where the Hamas leader is based, denied that the letter included any sense of recognizing the Jewish state or its right to exist. He said that Zahar sent a letter to Anan, but he did not recognize Israel or mention anything related to Israel's right to exist. Zahar's letter reiterated previous calls from Hamas for peace talks with the international community, although the radical Islamist faction has refused to renounce violence, explicit to recognize Israel or previous peace agreements. In response, Israel said today that despite the letter, Hamas had not changed its stance toward the Jewish state and remained committed to its destruction. The Israeli Foreign Ministry spokesman said that in this letter, the Palestinian Foreign Minister did talk about cooperation and peace in the region, but according to the Foreign Ministry, quote, unfortunately, he talks of the region without Israel, as in no part of this letter does he mention the existence of Israel. Embattled Iraqi Prime Minister Ibrahim al-Jafari remained defiant today after calls from President Jalal Talabani urging him to step down to break weeks of deadlock on the formation of a new government. Meanwhile, ousted President Saddam Hussein, back on trial, accused the country's Shiite-led interior ministry of killing and torturing thousands of people. Iraqi Prime Minister Ibrahim al-Jafari's fate will be decided in Parliament if he does not voluntarily step down. In remarks published today in Saudi Arabia's al Madina newspaper, President Jalal Talabani said that consultations were taking place and quickly expressed his hope they would not take any longer. And if the Shiite alliance insisted on nominating Ibrahim al-Jafari, then they would resort to Parliament. Jafari has come under growing pressure from Iraqi and Western officials to step down to break an impasse over forming a government for months after parliamentary elections. Jafari's appointment has yet to be confirmed. The alliance, as the biggest bloc in parliament, has the right to nominate the prime minister, but if the presidency council, which consists of Talabani and his two vice presidents, fails to agree on the candidate, parliament must elect another by a two-third majority. In another development, Saddam Hussein returned to court this morning and in remarks likely to inflame sectarian tensions, immediately accused the Iraqi interior ministry of killing and torturing thousands of of Iraqis. The toppled leader who could face a death sentence remained defiant one day after the court announced that he could face a new charges of genocide against the ethnic Kurdish population in the late 1980s. He could face another trial as early as next month. Saddam refused to sign documents, saying that only an international court would be fair, and denounced the interior ministry. When the judge interrupted him, Saddam said, quote, if you're scared of the interior minister, he doesn't scare my dog. 
Saddam and seven co-accused are charged with killing 148 Shiite Muslims after an attempt on his life in the town of Dujail in 1982. He said he was acting within the law against people who tried to kill him. The special tribunal trying Saddam said on Tuesday that he would face charges of genocide against the Kurds who accused him of killing more than 100,000 people and destroying thousands of their villages in the late 1980s. During his trial today, the ousted Iraqi president, Saddam Hussein, gave a statement rebutting the legitimacy of the accusations concerning the execution of 148 citizens in the village of the jail in 1982. Saddam renewed his claim that he remains the president of Iraq and the commander of the armed forces. In the shadow of the deadlock and the formation of the government, four people were killed in Iraq by two booby-trapped cars. In addition, five bodies were were found in separate areas in Baghdad. It kills thousands of people in the streets after torturing them. While reiterating that he does not recognize the court, the former President Saddam Hussein used strong language to launch accusations against the current interior ministry. This is how Saddam began his speech immediately after the resumption of the 18th court session of the trial of Saddam Hussein and his associates on the DJL case. During cross-examination, Saddam stood alone at the witness stand in the presence of his defense team, which included the new Egyptian lawyer Amin Farid who confronted the Attorney General by requesting explanations about certain evidence and documents that are stacked against Saddam Hussein. Saddam defended his decision to execute 148 people from the jail. According to legal experts, this case has reached its end. I think that the court, rather than being a court of law, has to a great extent already decided its verdict based on the intimidating tone of the court, which the defendants are partially responsible for. This includes outside political pressure and the influence of the media. In addition, relying on the careless accusations rather than the factual events increases the probability to 80, 85 percent that the court has already reached a verdict. So it might not seem... Meanwhile, the derailment of the political negotiations among Iraqi parties concerning the formation of a new government is further complicated by the persistence of Ibrahim Jafari on his candidacy for prime minister. This happens despite calls from within the United Iraqi Alliance for Jafari to withdraw his nomination. The political parties in Iraq are faced with two alternatives. The first is taking a decisive position that demands Jafri to step aside and to open the way for a more acceptable candidate. This alternative is difficult for Jafri to accept, especially if his nomination is confirmed. On the ground, three people were killed and 18 others were injured by two booby trap cars in Baghdad. A female and two male translators were killed for working with the multinational forces in Baghdad and Iwan in the south in separate attacks. A policeman was killed by gunshots from armed assailants near Hueja, and another civilian was killed by gunshots from the American forces near Takrit. In addition, one Iraqi civilian and two truck drivers who were working at one of the American bases near Dujail, north of the capital, were killed. Saudi, Baghdad. The Palestinian Prime Minister Ismail Haniyeh confirmed that the Israeli military escalation is an attempt to derail the political process and blackmail the new government. At a press conference prior to holding the first session of the new government, Haniyeh said that his government will submit detailed plans to confront the challenges it is facing, especially relating to security and the difficult financial situation of the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Finance Minister announced this evening that the United Arab Emirates Saudi Arabia and Kuwait pledged $80 million to the Palestinian government.
While Israeli measures have prevented the Council of Ministers from conferring with one another, the first session of the 10th Palestinian government since the inception of the Palestinian Authority was held between Gaza and Ramallah over closed circuit video. The meeting addressed many issues, most importantly the internal situation, the financial condition of the Palestinian Authority, the results of the Khartoum summit and the Israeli military escalation. The government called on the international community to quickly intervene to stop the Israeli aggressors, which have not succeeded in politically blackmailing the government. The government confirmed that this escalation will not affect the determination of the Palestinian people or the will of the Palestinian government. It will not change the political positions that affect legitimate Palestinian rights. The Palestinian Prime Minister also addressed the topic of opening contacts with Israel, saying that his government does not prohibit communicating with Israeli officials on issues that relate to the Palestinians' daily lives. But he excluded any political negotiations because the government is not authorized to make a political settlement. We have differences over political negotiations, which should happen within a political vision. At the same time, we must wait until something is approved proposed to us. When something is proposed to us, we will study it and define our position. The Palestinian foreign minister denied that Dr. Mahmoud Zahar's letter to the Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, included an implied recognition of Israel. The government attributed the confusion over this issue to media distortion of the content of the letter. The position of the government will be outlined in a statement by the minister. I think that some media outlets distorted what was in the letter, perhaps for political reasons or perhaps because there was a understanding of Dr. Azhar's letter. On the same topic, the Israeli Foreign Ministry confirmed that the Hamas movement has not changed its position, saying that Dr. Al-Zahar's letter was talking about the region without referring to Israel. On the table of the new Palestinian government lie huge and complicated files, which must be resolved. Most important among them, the security breakdown and the financial situation of the Palestinian Authority. However, the government vowed to overcome all these challenges through detailed strategies that will be presented by each ministry. إذن وكما جاء في التقرير فقد نفى المتحدث باسم حركة حماس مشير المصري ما نصب مشير المصري the spokesman for Hamas denied that the foreign minister Dr. Mahmoud Zahar referred to a two-state solution in his letter to the United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan. Masri indicated that the letter dealt with the Israeli escalation in the Palestinian territories. الإسرائيلية في الأراضي الفلسطينية. We want to correct this news, which has been systematically distorted. We confirm that Dr. Zahar's letter did not directly or indirectly discuss the two-state solution. Rather, it addressed the Israeli occupation escalation, which affects the stability in the region. We confirm that we will not change our position or betray our Palestinian people. Today, during an Israeli incursion in Nablus into the northern West Bank, an Israeli soldier was injured by gunshots coming from armed Palestinians. A spokesman for the occupation Israeli army said that two activists were arrested during the operation. Yesterday evening, 12 other Palestinians who were being pursued by the Israeli security agency in the West Bank were arrested. In the village of Beit Lahia in northern Gaza Strip, at least one Palestinian was murdered by Israeli tank missiles. Israeli warplanes also launched two missiles at a helicopter airfield belonging to the general headquarters of the Palestinian Authority in the center of Gaza, injuring two policemen. Other planes fired a number of missiles in an uninhabited area of the northern Gaza Strip. Meanwhile, hundreds of Palestinians held a funeral for a young man who was murdered yesterday in the village of Beit Lahia in the northern Gaza Strip as a result of a missile attack by Israeli tanks. A spokesman for the Israeli army announced that the attack came in response to Palestinians launching missiles. Of officers suffered moderate wounds during a counter-terror mission in Nablus today. 
During the operation, Israeli troops detained two would-be suicide bombers who are planning attacks in, in Israel. IBA's Dennis Sin has more in this report. The large IDF force took part in the Fedor Nablus raid. Four terrorists were arrested and taken away for questioning. Security investigators said that two were about to set out on a suicide bombing mission inside Israel. They were identified as Ayman Tashtush and Osama El Osata, both residents of the Nablus area. One is a member of the Islamic Jihad organization and the other a popular front for the liberation of Palestine activists. It's still not clear whether or not the two intended to carry out a joint attack. The raid began when the idea force surrounded a house where the terrorists were said to be hiding. A heavy exchange of shots erupted when gunmen in the house opened fire at the soldiers. One of the officers commanding the operation was wounded and evacuated to hospital in moderate condition. Sources in the IDF Northern Command said many Israeli citizens' lives were saved as a result of last night's arrests in Nablus. And in the Gaza Strip last night, IDF gunners shelled the open areas from where five Qassam rockets were launched yesterday in the direction of Ashkelon. A Palestinian was killed and four others wounded in the barrage. Palestinian security officials said the four, including a four-month-old baby, were in a house that was damaged. A senior IDF officer said Israel takes every precaution not to harm innocent bystanders. However, he added, the IDF will not stand idle if the terrorists use the civilian population as cover while carrying out the attacks on Israel. Another Qassam was fired at Ashkelon today, causing no damage and no injury. Dennis Zinn, IBA News. RGC's Navy debuted a top-secret missile in the Persian Gulf waters on Wednesday, day six of the ongoing naval war games, codenamed the Great Prophet, saw the successful test firing of a long-range anti-surface cruise missile, which, unlike other similar projectiles, needs no OTHT systems to intercept and destroy its target. The unique Iranian-manufactured radar-evading missile can be easily launched from all fixed-wing or rotating-wing military aircraft. Also during the day, amphibious airborne and anti-airborne operations were conducted successfully in the Persian Gulf waters. The military drills featured an electrifying performance by high-speed vessels. Landing craft backed by jet fighters landed troops at the combat zone where they attacked and pounded the positions of the mock enemy. The joint naval maneuvers involving units from the Army and the Islamic Revolution Guards for the IRGC span a hundred square mile area in the Persian Gulf and the Sea of Oman. IRGC Commander Major General Rahim Safavi, who oversaw the military exercises on Wednesday, said the war games come to show that the Iranian military is ready to safeguard the country's national interests. He said the maneuvers, featuring locally produced state-of-the-art military hardware, have a message of peace and pose no threat whatsoever to the regional countries. Beijing says Tehran IAEA cooperation is a must to end the long-running Iranian nuclear row. Chinese negotiating chairman of the UN Security Council, Wang Guangyu, said in the United Nations in New York, the recent statement released by the Council aimed at the magnifying the role played by the International Atomic Energy Agency to resolve Iran's nuclear case. President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad told a gathering of MPs and women's fraction of the parliament on Wednesday that national development is a possibility as Iran enjoys ample resources for the cause. He further said, fulfillment of features of a genuine Islamic government is a major duty to be shouldered by the government and parliament this year, which has been already named as the year of the great prophet. As for futile attempts by the West to deprive Iran of its legal nuclear right, the president said resistance against world powers still holds the key to victory. Tehran says the nuclear talks with Europe came to an end due to the West's double standards. 
Iranian Foreign Minister Manucheh Muttaki made the remarks in an interview with the Swiss daily Lutan and added Tehran would defend its legal right to have peaceful nuclear know-how enshrined in the Article 4 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Muttaki voiced readiness to continue nuclear talks with Europe and said he was also confident a compromise would be reached within the 30-day deadline set in the UN Security Council statement. Iranian Foreign Minister concluded Iran will never use oil as a political leverage and will continue to honor its commitments, especially to its Asian customers. Egyptian President Mohammed Hosni Mubarak has expressed optimism and gratitude regarding his recent visit to Sudan, confirming that his meeting with the Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir was very constructive. We also confirmed that their negotiations regarding a number of outstanding regional and international issues, including the Darfur crisis, were very productive. Both leaders called on all concerned parties to put an end to this crisis in order to bring a lasting peace to the entire region. President Mubarak also talked highly of the historic relations between Cairo and Khartoum. Hosni Mubarak, Rais of the Arabian Arabia, in a short visit. His Excellency Mr. Mohammed Hosni Mubarak, President of the Arab Republic of Egypt, has arrived in Khartoum for a short visit. He was met by the Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir and a number of government senior officials. Mr. Mubarak was accompanied by Ahmed Abdel Ghait, Egyptian Foreign Minister, Mr. Anas Al-Fiqhi, Egyptian Minister of Information, Minister Omar Suleiman, Dr. Zakaria Azmi, Head of the Parliament, and the official spokesman for the Office of the President, Ambassador Suleiman. Man, Awad. Both presidents held talks about recent developments in the Darfur region. They also called on all parties to intensify efforts to resolve the crisis peacefully. They also discussed the outcome of the Khartoum summit and encouraged bilateral cooperation between their nations. President Mubarak's visit to Sudan, including his meeting with President Omar al-Bashir, revealed the bond and brotherly relations between the two leaders and nations. In a joint conference, the Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir confirmed that Mubarak's visit comes on the heels of ongoing negotiations and consultations between Cairo and Khartoum regarding outstanding regional and international issues. He also expressed hope that the current Abuja negotiations will lead to comprehensive and lasting peace in the region. Mr. al-Bashir blamed Sudanese armed groups for the stall in the negotiations in the Abuja, describing them as lacking clear political visibility. <laughs> وهي حقيقة تأتي في إطار التواصل والتشاور المستمر بين مصر والسودان President Mubarak continued ongoing talks and consultations between Egypt and Sudan regarding many regional and international problems and other troubling issues. Of course, all eyes are now focused on the Abuja negotiations. President Mubarak exerted a tremendous effort, including talks with world leaders, in order to find a peaceful solution for the Darfur crisis. We hope that we can reach a comprehensive and lasting peace in Darfur in the near future, God willing. في مباحثات دارفور وكلنا أمل أنه نحن نصل إلى نتائج إيجابية وسلام نهائي في دارفور في القريب العاجل إن شاء الله President Mohammed Hosni Mubarak confirmed that he opposes foreign intervention in the Darfur region. He also announced that the Darfur crisis must be resolved under Arab or African supervision and before the deadline that was set by the African Council for Peace and Security. He added that his visit to Sudan furthers discussion and negotiation regarding recent developments in the southern Sudanese region of Darfur and the implementation of the Abuja peace process. Egyptian 
and Sudanese relations are crucial and long-lasting. We come here to discuss and consult with one another in issues of a great concern to both nations and the entire region. We held talks about the Sudanese southern region and the Darfur crisis, hoping that the political situation there will continue to improve. We will continue to negotiate and discuss other issues in the near future, God willing. Egypt does not support the deployment of foreign troops in the region of Darfur. However, it supports an Arab or an African solution to the crisis. Deploying international forces in Darfur has repercussions, and we must be aware of that. I will meet again with President al-Bashir and other world leaders in order to find a solution to this problem. His Excellency Mr. Mohammed Hosni Mubarak, President of the Arab Republic of Egypt, and his delegation headed back to Cairo after wrapping up a short visit to Khartoum. President Al Bashir and a number of ministers and government officials escorted him to the airport. <laughs> الصحراوي يلتقي اليوم الرئيس الصحراوي محمد عبد العزيز خلال اقامته بنيويورك سفراء البلدان الخمسة عشر الاعضاء في مجلس الامن وعددا من During his visit to New York Western Sahara President Mohammed Abed Al Aziz met ambassadors of the 15 members of the United Nations Security Council and a number of other African envoys Mr Abed Al Aziz is scheduled to meet American politicians and congressmen during a stop in Washington العميقة اذا الوضع بالصحراء الغربيه المتسم كما قال بالاعتداءات الصارخه Mr. Abed Al Aziz voiced his concern over the political situation in the Western Sahara, holding the Moroccan occupation forces responsible for the recent escalation against the people there. This news came as he met with Secretary General of the United Nations Kofi Annan. Mr. Abed Al Aziz confirmed that the United Nations should implement resolutions that guarantee the legitimate rights and self determination for the people of the Western Sahara. Despite the hard living conditions in the Western Sahara, local refugees are determined to continue. Continue the struggle towards freedom and self determination. On the road leading to Tafit, a Western Sahara liberated town, we met this family, a Saharan family living the life of a refugee in its own country. The day can be very long in this refugee camp, especially during the spring. However, this resilient family tried to make the best of it. Despite hard living conditions here, this proud family is determined to live a traditional life, just like any other Arab families. I'm a refugee in this camp. I miss the good old days, especially during the spring. I've been here for one month. I like the weather here. There is grass and pastures everywhere. Life can be great here. We have spectacular views and natural scenes. Local residents in this refugee camp and other parts of the Western Sahara are determined to continue the fight for their freedom and self-determination. We demand justice and freedom. We want to enjoy the freedom enjoyed by our ancestors. We do not have any freedom whatsoever and we are very frustrated. We have previously rejected these incomplete solutions to our national problem, including autonomy. We demand a free, just, and a transparent solution, which will ultimately lead to a self-rule and independence. <laughs> Hope and life goes on in this refugee camp. Meanwhile, local officials appeal to the international community to provide assistance and relief to these displaced refugees. They demand freedom and self-determination to these areas of the Western Sahara.
The views expressed on Mosaic are not those of Link TV or its sponsors, but of the broadcasters themselves. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation and Henry and Virgilia Dakin. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. For a transcript of this program, to watch streaming video, or for instructions on how to receive Link TV in the United States, visit linktv.org.